While they're making their way downstairs, I invite you to make your way to our focal passage today, Romans chapter 1. We'll, begin, we'll look at verses 18 through 23, beginning here in just a few moments. Today we're going to talk about a fallen world, especially the fallen world in which we live, the United States of America. Terry asked me last week about this song, and if I thought it would be appropriate. And I said, that's more than appropriate. That's more than appropriate. In fact, it's needed. And I was so thrilled. She asked me last Sunday to consider it, to listen to the song. She had already given me the musical book to go with it, and wanted me to listen to the song and just let her know by email. All I had to do on Monday was write a big a, a note, an email note in capital letters. Y-E-S. Yes, that is a very appropriate song. Terry, thank you for bringing that. And it does speak to the world in which we live and, and the America in which we live. And In many ways, if you were to think about it, what, what has gone wrong with America? And I keep thinking about it. It seems like every week, certainly very often, if not every week, we see news reports about some low-level federal judge sitting on some, some obscure court out in the middle of Nevada or Pennsylvania or wherever it might be, one single judge coming down and making a decision that overrules the law of the land and opens the doorways to further depravity in our nation. And, and by this one ruling of a single judge, the United States Congress, the Votes of the people are overruled. My family watches television. They've got several shows that my family watches. I don't watch a lot of television, I'll be honest with you, but I'm in the room oftentimes while they're watching. and The shows that are available for our entertainment... How many times do they use God's name in vain? How many times is foul language just a part of the regular vernacular of the, of the script for television? Prime time television. How many times, if we could bleep out the words, would it be done so in just the course of five minutes? The foul language on television. And now I'm beginning to think that a producer can't make a, a movie or a series for television unless at least one gay person is in the script. I think of our federal government and the absolute hypocrisy in the way they're dealing with illegal immigrants. At my former church, I was sharing this with somebody last week. I think it's Francis. My former my family, my former church, had taken in a exchange student, much like the Durant family did with with Reuben. Well, that exchange student fell in love with America, and I believe they were from the, uh, is one of the former Soviet provinces. I don't know if it was the Ukraine or Romania or where it was. I forget, but one of the former parts of the Soviet bloc, but they fell in love with America, they came back, they got their college degree here, she, this lady stayed on and got her medical degree, she stayed on and became a medical intern, finished her internship, I think it's called, her residency, that's what it's called, her residency, she became employed at a major medical facility in, the, in Michigan, all legally, she had all the right papers and now the federal government, she got married here by the way, and now the federal government, the administration, is telling her she must leave our nation for six months. Although they're opening their arms to all these illegals swarming across our border, dishing out our taxpayer dollars to support them. The hypocrisy of our federal government in dealing with the illegal immigrants. And I think of the hypocrisy of our executive branch when the Department of Justice has, has been given orders by our president not to enforce certain laws of the land. I'm particularly thinking of the Defense of Marriage Act. 
The Attorney General has been ordered by President Obama not to defend the law of the land, not even to, to put a, a case against, not even stand up for it in court. Just ignore it. In fact, I believe our President is abusing his executive powers at an alarming rate. And President Barack Obama not only is abusing and failing the office of our presidency, he is unashamedly proclaiming support for Islam in this Christian nation. I want America back. I want America back. And when I read this passage that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. This was written 2,000 years ago, but it might as well have been written yesterday because it speaks so clearly to the state of where we're at today. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, reading through verse 23, I invite you, if you're willing and able, to stand with me this morning as you read this passage. As we honor God's Word, as we strive to obey God's Word. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. You follow along with whatever translation you have. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, your neighbor will share with you. If they don't have a Bible, there's a copy of the Bible in the pew pocket in front of you. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Read from the New American Standard. You follow along with whatever translation you have. Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor God as God or give thanks, but they became futile and their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading and hearing of His Word. You may be seated. Folks, with your permission, I'm not going to hold back today. I'm not going to hold back today. This will be a hard-hitting sermon. Perhaps some of you of a different political persuasion than I may take offense to it. So be it. I'm going to preach from God's Word as I think it applies to our nation of today. And if it makes some of you mad, I'm sorry you're mad. But I will never apologize for preaching the truth of God's Word. And today I believe wholeheartedly when I read this Scripture, this speaks to the fallen state of our world. Look again at verse 1. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Paul is warning us here. Paul is warning the people of Rome, and by extension all who would read this epistle. Those who would read this, these words which have become part of the divine Word of God, the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. All individuals through all eras of time, regardless of where they live, what their circumstances are, the political boundaries in which they find themselves, all people who read this had best take warning. Had best take warning. Point number one, what Paul's trying to say here is, there we are, our nation and all of sinful man will face the wrath of God unless we turn back to Him. You know, the world will tell you that there is no God. 
But God is real and the wrath of God is certain. John Murray, an author, and I believe he is a pastor, defined God's wrath like this in one of his books. He said, God's wrath is the holy revulsion of God's being against that which is the contradiction of His holiness. And Paul tells us in verse 18 that we just read that the wrath of God is certain for at least two classes of people. In fact, I say this kind of summarizes the class. You could say these are the two general categories of people which God's wrath will fall upon. Number one is those who are godless and wicked. Those who are godless and wicked. And number two is those who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And many times those two groups overlap. They are one and the same. But God's wrath is certain. Why will this happen? And I believe it's clear. God is angry. God is angry. The word in verse 18 that we have translated in our English versions as wrath actually is a more complex word that can mean wrath, anger, or punishment. And when I say that God is angry, I'm not talking about the kind of anger that you and I experience from time to time. I'm not talking about something that just makes us mad and we have this sudden outburst of emotion that we tend to think about when we say that someone is angry. For you and me, our anger typically arises suddenly and with little provocation. It's an anger that quickly blazes up into a fire when we're confronted with something that deeply offends us or our values. Our anger is usually the result of an emotional outburst. And our anger often quickly dissipates once we allow our emotions to cool off and to cool down. But that is not the kind of anger that God displays. I believe for God it builds up slowly. It builds up over time. And when God gets angry, it is a just and a righteous anger. God's anger is an anger that stands against the sin and the evil, stands against the violence and the slaughter, stands against the immorality and the injustices of man. God's anger is an anger that hates sin. God's anger is an anger that hates evil. And God's anger causes Him to dish out a just revenge and justice. We see God's anger displayed for us in the biblical text, the biblical narrative. God's anger is seen in His judgment. An example is Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. When Jesus saw some of the Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious, righteous, self-righteous individuals coming for baptism, He said to them, I quote these words, He said, you brood of vipers? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He knew they would face the judgment. God's anger is unleashed on those who disobey the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 3.36 it says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And we see that God was angry with the children of Israel. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 18 is very blunt. It said, so the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from His sight. And that's just three verses that speak of the anger and the wrath of God. And folks, I believe this with all my heart. I believe that if God had reason to be angry with the children of Israel, He has even more reason to be angry with the children in America. Amen? He has much more reason to be angry with America. Therefore, I am convinced that unless this nation turns back to our Lord, then we as a nation will face the outpouring of the wrath of God. A verse that's very familiar to many of us is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And we think of that oftentimes when we think about prayer. That if we pray, our nation will come back to God. That prayer is the key to revival. But listen to the full context, the full content of that verse. The Lord says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face 
and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will hear their land. Folks, this nation must turn back to God. This nation must turn back to God or this nation will face the wrath of God. Can I get an amen in the house? Amen. amen. That's point number one. Point number two. Our nation has no excuse for our sinful ways. Our nation has no excuse for our sinful ways. And Paul makes it clear in verse 19 that no one has any excuse for recognizing that God is real. He says that that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. What Paul is saying here is that the ways of God are embedded within the heart of man. He put that in us. Therefore, our nation has no excuse for the path of sin and the immorality that we have embarked on. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul warns his readers about the coming day when lawlessness will prevail. What he's talking about is the end times, the eschaton, the end of the ages. But I believe that we can clearly see in that warning the signs of the end times which are in the days in which we live. Look at what he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. I'm sorry, I did not put this on the screen, but listen to this. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Folks, if our nation didn't take pleasure in wickedness, then Hollywood as we know it would go bankrupt. The entertainment industry as we know it would not exist. The lyrics of these songs that are being force-fed to our children would have no place to be heard. Our nation is taking pleasure in, wick in, in, wick in wickedness instead of taking pleasure in our Lord. Our nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Our founding fathers believed in the guiding hand of the providential God. Our country was built on the biblical worldview of morality and justice. But we are not that nation anymore. We are not that nation anymore. Our nation has no excuse for our sinful ways. And unless our nation turns back to the Lord, we will face the terrible wrath of a just and righteous God. Say amen if you agree with that. That is not a sign that we are anxious about that in the sense that we look to that. Amen is saying that we agree with that. Our nation has no excuse for our sinful ways. Point number one, our nation and all of sinful man will face the wrath of God unless we turn back to Him. Point number two, our nation has no excuse for our sinful ways. Point number three, our nation has made a deliberate path, a deliberate path into immorality and self-destruction. Our nation has made a deliberate path into immorality and self-destruction. We see that in verse 20. But instead of following the ways of God, our nation has plunged head first, head first if you would, into the abyss of sin and immorality and our self-destructive ways. Ponder these questions with me if you would. What other great nation has ever denied their children the right to pray in public like our nation did in 1963 when prayer was outlawed in our public schools? What other great nation has ever celebrated gay athletes as heroes while allowing the real heroes, our wounded warriors, to languish for months without proper medical care? What other great nation has ever pushed so hard for a pro-gay public policy when far less than 10%, most surveys say less than 5% of 
of the population is actually gay. What other great nation has ever allowed a single judge to make decisions and legislate from the bench what would effectively become the law of the land? What other great nation has ever been led by, by an administration that routinely ignores the law of the land and governs as if the law does not apply to them? Our nation, this supposedly great nation, is on the fast track to destruction, certain to face the wrath of a God that has lost patience, imploding on all sides due to a lack of moral stability, and destined to fall into ruin and lay waste due to our sinful ways and our immoral compass. Our nation has chosen a deliberate path into immorality and self-destruction. And we have no one to blame but ourselves. Point number one, our nation and all of sinful man will face the wrath of God unless we turn back to Him. Point number two, our nation has no excuse for our sinful ways. Point number three, our nation has made a deliberate path into immorality and self-destruction. And point number four, our nation mocks God instead of honoring God. Our nation mocks God instead of honoring God. And not only are we mocking God, we are encouraging other countries to mock God as well. I want to read you an excerpt from an email I received just over a week ago from the American Renewal Project. It's a group of people trying to get conservative values back in America. Listen to the report that they issued. And I quote, President Barack Obama has taken the U.S. gay rights revolution global, using American embassies across the world to promote a cause that still divides his own country. With gay parades taking place in many cities across the world this weekend, this is last weekend, it says the U.S. role will be more visible than ever. Diplomats will take part in these gay pride parades and some of our American embassies will fly the rainbow flag along with the stars and stripes. In fact, the United States just last year sent five openly gay ambassadors abroad. And there's a sixth nominee to Vietnam who's gay, now awaiting Senate confirmation. Embassies, the United States embassies, have been opening their doors to gay rights activists, hosting events and supporting local advocacy group. Secretary of State John Kerry and the State Department has since spent $12 million on the efforts in over 50 countries through the Global Equality Fund, an initiative launched to fund the new work. I'll be blunt. I am ashamed of those at the pinnacle of our government when they take stands like that. I am ashamed to say that that's my president and those are my leaders. Our nation continues to mock God instead of honoring God. Point number one, our nation all of sinful man will face the wrath of God unless we turn back to Him. Point number two, our nation has no excuse for our sinful ways. Point number three, our nation has made a deliberate path into immorality and self-destruction. Point number four, our nation mocks God instead of honoring God. And point number five, our nation has arrogantly turned away from God. Our nation has arrogantly turned away from God. Look again at verses 22 and 23. 
professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That part in verse 23 that talks about the hand-fashioned idols, we don't have that in America. But Lord, we have things that might as well be idols in America. Many of our leaders and many of our fellow citizens believe they are too wise to believe in God. Many of our leaders and many of our fellow citizens think they are too intelligent to believe in the Bible. They may claim to be wise, but folks, they are showing their arrogance and their ignorance. They are exchanging the incorruptible glory of God for their corruptible way of thinking and living. And I agree wholeheartedly with that song the choir sang earlier. Something's wrong with America. She once held the Bible as her conscience and guide. But we've allowed those who hold nothing to be sacred to push morals aside. We want America back. Amen? We want America back. We want America back. So folks, let's take America back. Let's take America back. Well, preacher, what do you do? What can we do? Oh yeah, there's something we can do. I told you about the American Renewal Project. It wasn't too long ago. Sometime in the spring, I went to a state meeting they had in Greenville, South Carolina. Learned some things that astounded me about the state not only of how our leaders are leading, but what is influencing our leaders. Listen to this. Statistics show that every other member of this church, every other member of this church of voting age, is probably not even registered to vote. And more surprisingly, of those who are registered to vote, typical election, maybe half of those will actually show up to vote. Here's the stats. There are 65 million evangelicals, that's Christians, conservative, Bible-believing Christians of adult age in America. 65 million of those. This last national election, only 50% or so Most surveys show that less than 50% of that 65 million were registered to vote. And of those that were registered to vote, maybe half actually did vote. In other words, in the last national election, 48 million evangelicals, Bible-believing conservative Christians, did not vote in the last election. And of those who did vote, that half of the half, the quarter, of those who did vote, surveys also show that a considerable number voted based on the empty promises of politicians and not based on their biblical viewpoints or values. In other words, they voted on which candidate promised the most to me in terms of benefits. If that trend continues, the church will never make a difference in the political process. Listen to these words on a report of the ARP, the American Renewal Project issue. It says that politicians bow down to the culture bullies because they know that half of all the Christians in America don't register to vote. They are also aware that half of those that are registered to vote will never cast a ballot. Political figures are merely actors on a stage performing a script written by their audience. They are not influenced by those who speak up, but they they pay close attention to those who show up. Have you ever taken a survey, a political survey? Politicians, if they look at at petitions, for instance, presented by a group of Christians, They look at that petition, the number of of signatures on that petition, and they divide it by four. 
they divide it by four. Because remember our, our percentages. Of all the Christians, only half of us are registered to vote. And of that half, only half of them vote. Only one-fourth of the Christians actually vote. And not all of them vote according to their Christian values. When they see a small group of protesters, however, a small group of protesters with a reputation for contributing big money and consistently casting ballots, they multiply that small group by ten. They take ours and divide it by four. They multiply the voters by ten. Christians don't influence politicians by raising their voices, signing petitions, or, quote, eating more chicken. They do it by registering to vote and actually voting. Actually casting ballots. There is a huge difference between symbolism and substance. Politicians pay lip service to symbolism. But politicians pay a whole lot of service and attention to substance. 65 million evangelical conservative Christians in America. Less than half voted. Less than half of, or were, were, were registered to vote. Less than half still actually voted. That leaves 48 million evangelicals who did not vote in the last election. Political scientists tell us this. If the Christian conservative evangelical would have only cast three million more ballots, we would have taken back our national elected offices. That's how close we are. Only three million more. Forty-eight million sat at home. Just one out of every 16 of those would have made a big difference. If we're going to take our country back. We've got to start where we can make the biggest influence. First Tuesday in November is right around the corner. Thank God we have a chance to elect a new president in just over two years. Democrats, if you think Hillary's the answer to all, you ain't read your Bible. I have never, ever disliked two politicians more in my life than the Obamas and the Clintons because of the way they are steering this nation and continue to try to steer this nation into the moral abyss that they call liberty. I call that the path to damnation and hell. Three million of us can make a difference. Some of that three millions in this room today, you did not vote last time. Shame on you. Shame on you. Make it right. Make it right. Others of you have never voted, even though you're of legal age to do so. And your thought is, my vote won't make a difference anyway. Really? Really? It'll make a vote. It'll make a difference. What can you do? You can register and take back this country. I'm going to give you the chance to do so. If you're not registered, I did the legwork for you. I've got the registration forms right here. But this is more about politics today. I told you this is about repentance. Yes, we need to pray for our country. Yes, we need to get more involved in the political process. Yes, we need to win the hearts and souls of America. But it begins with you and I. Am I believing the filth and the lies that our politicians are telling us? Am I believing that the accepted form of lifestyle is what Hollywood's promoting? 
Am I even myself promoting that? And believing that? And encouraging others to buy into that? Just one area. The gay area. I don't hate the homosexual. In fact, I hope to win them to Christ and baptize them right back there. Amen? But I hate what they're doing to my nation. I despise them pushing their sin off on my children and my entertainment. People are saying, well, pastor, why are you so vocal against the gays and not every other sin? I'll tell you why. They took the first swing. They took the first punch. They are trying to drive the agenda. I'm going to drive it back. Me, my church, fellow Christians, and my Lord, we're going to take this nation back. Amen? We're going to take this nation back. And if you think it is okay to live a lifestyle that's contrary to what the Bible teaches, I'm not going to pull any punches right now. Without Jesus Christ in your life, you are going to die and go to hell. There's no simple way around it. Don't believe that lie. That's what Satan wants you to do. That's why the Bible calls him the deceiver. They do it for good reason. He is a deceiver. He's going to try to get you to buy into that. He's going to get you to try to say it's okay. That's just a different lifestyle. No, it's not a different lifestyle. That is sin. Sin is detestable to God. Sin drives people away from God. Homosexuality in the Bible, if it says it it once that it's wrong, then it's wrong. If God says it twice in His Word, then that's emphasis. But there are at least seven major passages that deal with it. That's God saying, this is going to be a problem, and I want to face it. I want the people to know the consequences of it. Folks, we've got to start believing in our heart that we can make a difference. We've got to start believing in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. When those two things happen, and we get involved in the process, then we can make a difference. But if you want to pass down America the same way it is today to your children, your grandchildren, just come in here once a week, hear your pastor rave about it, and then go home and do nothing. Or you can take initiative and take this world back for Christ. Father God, help us this day to realize the enormity of the sin and the horrificness of the society in which we live. Father, help us to be determined to make a difference in this world, beginning in our own hearts. Father, help us to turn this nation back to You and let it begin with me. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.